Hey everybody, I hope you had a good week. Coach is here, and thank you for taking a couple of minutes. You know, the, um, the landscape lighting system in many people's home is an expensive luxury item that all have and fewer even maintain once they are in. This week, we are covering how to prolong the lifespan of this landscape luxury. You know, with a little preventative approach, we can avoid a large, costly lighting makeover. You know, that could run hundreds or even thousands of dollars to bring it back to life. Pretty simple, you know, straightforward, easy to remember steps to make your system shine bright 365 days a year. And I'm so glad you joined me today. Let's get started. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Every Friday I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. If you recall from other episodes, your landscape lighting system plays a key role in a few landscape functions. First and foremost, to many homeowners, the lighting system is an ambiance creator by highlighting key features of the landscape. Second, the system provides ease of navigation throughout much of your landscape after the sun has gone down. And third, landscape lighting really can provide an additional layer of home security. This is done by illuminating dark areas, pathways, and shrub and tree areas where those potential creepers, which I hope you don't have in your area, can look in and kind of case the place. Bright, well-lit, tastefully landscape-lighted landscapes and homes, eh, they can sometimes be passed right on by. But it has been my experience that many homeowners neglect this system after the honeymoon effect of like six months to a year has passed. Whether it be bulbs that expire and go out, fixtures that are hit, knocked over, broken, and left down, transformers that get all clogged with bugs and other potential inhabitants that are not wanted or a host of other potential failures. Most of these failures, you know, they really can be avoided, and many cases prevented with just a little TLC from you, the homeowner. First, let's break down the key components of your lighting system, then address the inspection, maintenance, and some repair if necessary of those systems. There are four of them. Number one is the transformer. The transformer is the electrical power center of the whole system. Number two is the cabling, the conduit, which the power runs to the fixtures. Number three is the fixtures themselves, the wired hardware that holds the bulbs, oftentimes decorative and pretty to look at. And number four, the bulbs or the light source. You know, approaching these four key components is easy and requires very little of your time, energy, and skill set. The other option, is to leave it and forget it and see how long it lasts. Yeah, yeah that, that's not how I operate. And I hope anybody who listens to me or has followed me for any period of time would understand that. So let's take a look at them, starting with transformers. This is where I always started when I was called out for inspection or repair calls. So let's start your inspection there as well. The transformer is the electrical device and it's plugged into a high voltage outlet that takes that high voltage and reduces it down by means of a transformer to low voltage for your lighting system. In many cases, depending on the age of the transformer, you will have one to four, sometimes even five, what they call voltage lugs that carry voltage ranging from 11 volts to 12, 13, 14, 15, I've seen 16 volts at times, depending on the brand. And why do you have those? 11 volts would be for really close in lighting. 16 volts would be voltage that needs to go maybe 80, 90, 100, 150 feet down range to the last fixture of whatever it's using. So it needs a little more oomph going out of that transformer and make sure that it's 11 and 12 volts by the time it gets through 
all that cable and all that voltage drop out to that last light. Okay, so when you open the front cover, if you have a cover, okay, there's some like the old Malibus and I think now the portfolio ones that you get at the box stores, they don't have that. They just have little push button fronts and electrical connections on the bottom and call it good. But for the more upgraded ones, you will have a louver front door. It'll either swing out on a hinge or you'll lift it up. Either way, a couple of things that you're going to see. One is you're going to see the on off switch. You may see a breaker. You may see a photo cell attachment, depending on how fancy a transformer it is. You'll see the lug branches generally either on the side or down at the bottom of the transformer. Maybe a mechanical or a digital timer, depending on yours. And then you have the wires incoming into the lugs, generally from the bottom in a cabling port or hole. Take a minute and inspect the overall cleanliness of the box's interior and clean it up as necessary. Sometimes, depending on your environment, you can get bugs and insects up in there. You can get spider webs. You can get all kinds of things. And if it gets too clogged up, you can actually have shorts that will check the system out and nothing will work. Wipe everything out. Blow it out. If you have a compressor, gently blow out the whole interior once or twice a year and get rid of all that unwanted mess. Next is check the tension on all the wire connections where they go into the lugs. The common lead is where some problems occur because too many wire legs are tried to be put up in there. And sometimes one wire is not connected as well as it should be. And sometimes that's the one that's causing a problem out in the landscape. A way to correct that is to do a, say like you have three or four wires coming in. And you got to go into one common lead port. Well, you can wire all those up and then just use one pigtail to put into your common lug. It's a little easier and guarantees a much, much more secure connection. Hey, check the timer schedule in your transformer. Make sure that your timer, whether it be digital or if it's the old mechanical Christmas tree light style, just check it. Look for that on time, generally with a, if it's one of the Christmas tree ones, where the little green pin starts, and then what time is it supposed to go off, where the red pin is. And make sure that it is going to align with the time of year that you're doing your inspection. And for the next one to three months, depending on the amount of daylight you have. I mean, in the height of summer, in upper Minnesota, heck, you might not have that thing even come on until after 11 o'clock. And if you're doing it for security, it'll probably go off around 5 a.m. And yet in the winter, it'll be exactly the opposite. That thing will probably come on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and won't go off until after 8 the next morning. Now, turn your transformer to on. You should hear that transformer operating and maybe even a slight hum that's coming from the transformer. If you want to get fancy and you want to double check everything inside there, you can get a little voltmeter or an ohmmeter, set it to the DC setting, and then put the testing prongs, one on the common and one on each lug, and, and look at it. If it says 12 volts, well, you should be seeing 12 volts come out of that on that voltmeter. And if it's 14 or 16, it should be the same. It's a nice, easy way to know that the transformer is one, working. Number two, it's actually doing its job as far as, you know, putting out the amount of voltage that it's saying it is. And you know that that wire, that cabling, is leaving the transformer with voltage in the cable. So it's one way to kind of knock out two birds with one stone. All right, once you have your transformer all dialed back in, cleaned up and ready to go for the next three to six months, whatever, we move on to the cabling itself. And we're gonna start back at that transformer. We've already inspected the cabling inside the box. Well, now let's check it as it leaves. Make sure there's no nicks, no nicks, cuts, anything as it leaves that sharp. If it's one of the, the sheet metal boxes, Sometimes, you know, if things get hit or bang, you know, that, that can wear on there. So you want to make sure that there's no copper connection hitting up against that sheet metal box. And if it is, tape it up. Tape up that cabling and protect it. So as long as you haven't had any recent digs in the path of where your cabling goes and you actually know where your cabling goes, you know, go along those pathways. Make sure there isn't anything that is... Uh, 
gone weird. You haven't, you know, planted a tree or put in a, a walkway or something where you knew the old cabling was and did it get hit by a shovel strike or a stake or something that could have caused a problem. Not much to do there unless we get to our next component, the fixtures. The fixtures can be, good Lord, they can be inexpensive plastic or certainly more ornate and elaborate metals and brass type fixtures. They can really be kind of a work of art. I can remember a job up in Sutter Creek, California that I did many, many years ago. And we're talking back at the turn of the century. <laughs> that sounds like I'm really, really old. But it was back in like 2003, four or 02, 03, something like that. And my clients, they spared no expense. They, they wanted Jurassic Park type <laughs> fixtures. And I can remember ordering up fixtures that were $450 a piece. Yes, I said a piece. And that was back in those days. You can only imagine what they would be worth now if they still made them. My God, they were, they were huge. They were huge, big, hooded. Oh my gosh, they were heavy. They probably weighed 12 pounds or more a piece. These fixtures are usually staked in the ground, whether they're up lights or path lights. And usually the stake is attached to a, uh, actually another stake. The ground stake is usually plastic and the, the stake or riser coming out of that ground mounted stake is usually the metal and decorated like the rest of the fixture. You can also find some of like the old wall washing type of light fixtures and they were mounted in old black, uh, not old, but they were mounted in uh, black ABS protective ABS sleeves. And then they were put, the, the actual light itself was mounted on kind of a swivel with a, a, a cross bracing type of system. And you put these in the ground itself, wired them up, and then you, you know, you would either do up lighting or you do wall washing or other things. So they were kind of bulletproof. The biggest problem I saw with them is they always got filled up with leaves and dirt and bugs and debris and oftentimes rusted out the connections of the lights themselves. You know, these fixtures are wired from the manufacturer when they're built with usually a, a wire that consists of about a 16-2 or an 18-2 cable. And when I say that, it's just the size of the wire itself. And the two means there's only two legs of it. These fixture wires are wired to your lighting system cable when it got installed. And that lighting cable comes from the transformer. The fixtures themselves can be left to the elements if you don't pay attention. And I guarantee you they will show their age soon enough. You know, if you're exposed to the sun all day, all night, all weather, all seasons, you know, you can only ask so much of these fixtures or you can maintain them and keep them nice with just a little bit of attention. If they are metal and they're colored with a, like a powder coat finish, man, you can go out there with a little bit of simple green or something and spray it on, wipe them down two or three times a year. And you can even put on the little spray on car wax on them. That's what I did with the ones at Weed Patch Ranch. And they stayed pretty nice for when we left, they were already five years old. And they were doing pretty darn good, I thought. You know, if you do this kind of cleaning, it will maintain the finish, <laughs> a much more newer-like finish and a newer-like state for quite a period of time. You know, if you get up underneath for the, the path lights and stuff, the path lights, spiders are really attracted to these things because, duh, of the light. So during the nighttime, that light, it draws in moths and all kinds of little flyers and stuff that hang out there in the warmer months. And they come into the light and get trapped in the trap and the web and bam, bam, bam. But go in there and wipe them all out. Wipe it down and take care of it. I guarantee you, if you wipe out the hood of those lights and stuff, they're going to reflect a lot more light. And it's going to look a lot better for a heck of a lot longer. You know, each fixture, when you're doing your inspection, <laughs> obviously this is a duh. Path lights should be upright. You know, and the, the stake should be in the ground and everything should be connected correctly. Many times with kids and doggos and other things, these things can get hit. Even, even the homeowners with wheelbarrows and mowers and whatnot, it can be hit. 
the, you know, the lawn care guy that comes in and oops, oh, dang, I, I knocked that over. Well, I'll just kind of leave it there and not say nothing. Seen them all, seen it. So if you're doing an install, remember your path lights, they should be set aside from the path itself. Depending on what kind of beam of light it casts, set it aside about a, a foot at least. That way it'll still light the path, but it'll be kind of out of the way from the path traffic. So the chances are mitigated downwards that you're not going to be hit and break them off. So in any case, you've looked at them, you've cleaned them up, you've maybe put a little wax on them, you've made them look good again. Okay? So remember, remember, if there's no brakes or anything else, your system is still on, right? You've left it on. Now's the time for our last component check. That's going to be the bulbs. A low voltage landscape lighting system isn't worth a crap if it doesn't light. So with the system on, check each fixture's bulb. Are they all on? <laughs> if they are, fantastic. That's good. Wipe the bulb with a dry cloth and call it good. If the bulbs have been there for a while and you've checked them all and they're all working, turn the system off momentarily. Go in and wipe the bulb after they've cooled a little bit. Wipe the bulb with a damp cloth. Get any hard water off of there. If there is some hard water, you can dip it in some CLR or something. Rinse it off, re-wipe it, put it back in, and get the bulb back in good shape so that it actually shines like it did when it was new. If the bulbs are on, if the bulbs are on and you've cleaned everything, you're good. System is basically in good operating order. And call yourself lucky. Now, not on, now we have to determine why. Obviously, a process of elimination enters into this. Is it the bulb? Is it the fixture? Is it the cabling? Etc. We don't know. So you have to start somewhere. If it's only one bulb on one cable, it's just one bulb, chances are it's going to be the bulb. Probably not if you have multiple bulbs out on the same line. Then you've got either a voltage spike that came from the transformer, you've got really old bulbs, no maintenance has happened for quite a while, or something else. you got something in the cabling world that might be need to be addressed. So where do we start? Replace the bulb and check. Put the new bulb in. Does it work? Perfect. If it is not, then we got to check the wiring of the fixture. And how is it wired to the cabling? Is it still good? Or did something come apart? Is it really corroded because it got shoved in the ground with no sort of protection? They used the wrong kind of wire nuts on there instead of a, a grease sealed one? Repair and then recheck. Eventually you're going to find the culprit. Always make sure the system is still on as you proceed. It's all kind of low voltage at this point. But if you get nervous about the electricity being on and you're fumbling around with stuff, okay, turn it off, try to fix it, and then run back and turn the transformer back on. If that still doesn't trip your trigger, so to speak, then call a pro in to give you a hand. 90% of the time, in my experience, 90% of the time, it was always the bulb. Especially it was the older incandescent bulbs, which are really going out of style. And I'll address that in a minute. If the fixture is subjected to a lot of sprinkler water all the time, bulb seats, where the bulb actually gets plugged in, and the connections throughout the whole fixture can really get deteriorated and rust out. Sometimes a replacement is going to be required. Sometimes cleaning only will suffice it. You can get fancy here too, like I did back at the transformer with you. You can get fancy here if problems persist with no bulbs coming on. Use that voltmeter again and make sure you have voltage that is coming through the cabling and to the fixture wire. Depending on the distance from the transformer, you might have a slightly decreased or lesser voltage due to the voltage drop over the distance between where your transformer is and where this light problem is. You know, you, you're gonna, unless you use bigger cable, you're gonna have a voltage drop as that electricity travels through that copper wire all the way out. Kind of like a pressure drop that you get in sprinkler lines too. Nowadays though, Many systems, many systems are using LED bulbs for the dramatically extended bulb life. The reliability, the lower wattage use, and the basic dependability of these things 
They've kind of come down in price over the last few years. They used to be kind of pricey when they first came out. And the thing is, is there is definitely more cost that you're going to put out up front, but less cost because you're going to be buying smaller transformers because the wattage use is not as big and less cable cost because you can put more fixtures on the same cable. So you don't have to run extra cabling all the time. You know, I remember the standard up light would be a 20 watt bulb, an incandescent bulb. And so you would add up 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts, 20 watts. Maybe you had 160 watts of up light in your system, lighting up lights and other things throughout the, the landscape. Well, now those bulbs in LED form are seven. So you can see where the wattage savings really is. So if you haven't yet, if you got a system that still has incandescent bulbs, consider switching over. I know for the systems that I installed, I probably stopped using incandescent bulbs back in, oh shoot, probably 2012. And I would actually buy the bulbs themselves, which added additional cost to the system and to my bottom line. But I knew that I was going to get them back in a few ways, like I mentioned a moment ago. They were going to perform a heck of a lot better for the customer. Plus, the savings came back to me because I didn't have, say, a 500 watt transformer. I only needed a 150 watt transformer or a 300 at the most. I'd never used anything over 300 since LED came out. Plus, the savings came back to me in the cabling, too. And copper is kind of expensive. So, think about it. Is 20 minutes maybe two to three times a year worth it to take care of your lighting system? <laughs> well, if you haven't picked up on it yet, hell yes it is. My gosh, the thing costs thousands of dollars to put in if you had a pro do it. And it probably costs hundreds and hundreds of dollars, if not low thousands, if you did it yourself. You know, the old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure thing really comes to the surface here. Take care of it, take care of your stuff. You can do this yourself. I know you can. You can know your system and keep it right on track all the time. Hey, and if you get stuck, you're listening to a coach that'll be more than willing to help you. Take care of what you have because it isn't getting cheaper to replace these days. And many times with the product pipeline problems, parts are few and far between sometimes. They really are, especially if you've got a dated fixture. Hey, check out some of my other podcasts if you get a chance. And, and the YouTube channel as well. I'll be over there later on. As always, to your landscape success, email me with any questions regarding lighting or any other landscape issue. And I'll say bye for now. Thanks for tuning in. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.